Hello everyone, Dr. Siddiqui here. Today I have joining me Dr. Chin. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you joining us today. Um, before we start, can you uh, share an interesting story or a uh, funny story that you've had in the medical field? I'm sure you've had- well, I, I have a really interesting story. And, and a couple of months ago, I had a patient come in. She was 16 years old. And for two years, she had been suffering from major headaches, chest pains, and lower abdominal pain. And the story was that at age 14, two years prior, she had fallen from a ceiling to the floor about 12 feet wow. because she had missed one of the cross beams while walking in the attic and fell through and landed basically on her neck and upper back. Now, she lost consciousness. Um, she was examined by doctors at Dartmouth, at Concord Hospital in, in New Hampshire, where I am, and also in Maine Medical Center, and none of them over two years could figure out what was wrong with her. Now, her mother, because of the abdominal pains, her mother had multiple abdominal surgeries for belly pain. And so they were thinking they were going to do a colonoscopy and an exploratory lap on a 16-year-old, wow. which is unheard of, really. Mm -hmm. So I took her in, and the grandfather heard about me with what I do with osteopathic manipulation. And I examined her just like every family practice, practitioner would do, which I am also. And... I found that she didn't, her abdomen was soft. She didn't have any evidence of a tumor, you know, like, and she had brain MRIs too, so we knew that was clear. And her chest, they did an EKG, they did a full cardiac workup, which was negative as well. So they did most of the work for me by that time. And so I found osteopathic lesions in her neck, upper back, first rib, and lower back as well as sacrum. So from the time I first met her to the time she, got manipulated and fixed was about 25 minutes. And the thing is, she got up for the first time after the manipulation and could not believe how she felt. She felt normal. And that's why I do what I do. I mean, this is stuff that osteopathic physicians and osteopathic students should know that what they're being given is a gift. We are the Swiss army knife of physicians, because if we can't figure out people with conventional allopathic methods, we can also bring out our osteopathic skills and diagnose that way. And that is a wealth of information to help us in helping our patients. Dr. Warren Chin. I am a DO who is a family practitioner in North Conway, New Hampshire. I first started in New York and then I ended up in Florida for 20 years. And then I ended up in New Hampshire because Florida was a bit too hot for me. So the, the uh, training I had was Columbia University at first and I had a B, BS in biology and chemistry. And then after that, I went to St. John's University in Queens, New York to do a master's in biology and then after that I decided to go to um, medical school and that's a story in itself I, my my mentor was uh, Dr. Stan Shywitz and he fixed me a couple of years prior when I had really bad back problems mm -hmm. and I decided to become a DL although I applied to MD and DL schools I went with NICOM now known as New York Institute of Technology College of Osteopathic Medicine mm -hmm. I like NICOM and I graduated in 1984, one of the first graduating classes from there. And we were lucky. We had great teachers, Dr. Shywitz, the G D Giovannis, both the Mrs. and uh, both Mr. and Mr. Dr. G Giovanni. And also for cranial, we had Viola Fryman. We had some really classic teachers. And that's part of why I got a really good training out of that. And they instilled in me the the need to find out more about osteopathic medicine. Okay. 
Beautiful. So let's talk about osteopathic medicine. What is this? For those of uh, the viewers that don't know what osteopathic medicine is versus allopathic medicine, can you give us a better idea? Well, let's give a little history lesson. Yes. Uh, A.T. Still was the originator of uh, osteopathic medicine. He lived around the Civil War era, and he was a Civil War doctor. And he felt that he was an MD, by the way. And in those days, to become an MD, you basically had to just have another MD uh, be able to follow, you know, to follow another MD around. And if you apprenticed with an MD for anywhere from two to five years, you became a doctor. Now for A.T. Still, he felt that a lot of the things that they were seeing could be musculoskeletal and they really didn't have anything to help fix that. They only had medicines. Mm -hmm. And in those days it was basically morphine. And you got morphine for everything. You got morphine for pneumonia. You got morphine for back pains. You got morphine if your leg got blown off. I mean, there it was pretty easy at that time. Now, we he had a lot of cadavers to study, and he studied the musculoskeletal system, and was able to figure out a lot of the things that we now know today as osteopathic manipulative technique. Um, and basically, people think that because we manipulate, we're chiropractors, but we're not. Mm -hmm. um, chiropractors actually borrowed from us. There's good evidence that the first chiropractor was a student of the first DO when he opened up his first school. And so, um, and, and the story behind that is that the chiropractor uh, dropped out of school within three to four weeks of starting of a five-year course. So that, if anything, chiropractors borrowed from us, not the other way around. Now, Another thing that uh, Dr. Shywitz always told me was that as DOs, we have to innovate. We can't just stay with certain techniques. Mm -hmm. If we find techniques that are easier to use or more effective, we should broadcast it to the rest of the world, to the other DOs. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's amazing. So um, let's talk about, um, you know, you have students and residents rotating with you. Let's talk about that. Um, are you, um, how can students get in touch with you and rotate with you? Well, right now I am moving on to another job. So when I find that information, it will be posted on LinkedIn. Okay. Now I took students at a, on a monthly basis and even as short as a week, I had a student come in for a week and she was first year and she had a great experience. Um, I do very much hands-on. So if you rotate with me, you can work on anywhere from 10 to 20 patients a day, wow. hands-on. And that is a great experience for a lot of the students because one of the biggest complaints I hear about training is that there is very little hands-on. Even when you go to a DO that says they manipulate, Mm -hmm. you might see them do it once or twice a day or may not see them do it at all. Mm -hmm. And as a student, the only thing you could think is, well, if they're not using it, why should I learn it? You know, and and it, it could be farther from, the, it can't be farther from the truth because once you see what the capabilities of osteopathic medicine are, you'll embrace it. You'll love it. You want to use it. And, and one of the things that I advocated for is I wrote an article in the DO it was called dispelling the myths of OMT mm -hmm. and that was written about a year or two ago and I dispelled the fact that it's it's easy to learn it's safe for the patients it's monetarily good for you um, I've always made a very good living just from doing manipulation and family practice and in general I made more than my MD counterparts so that's an incentive as well but the fact is that you help so many people. I mean, people come in with walkers and wheelchairs and leave without them. The other patients are saying, who did they see? <laughs> it's, it's a pretty dramatic thing. Absolutely. So you kind of brushed up on uh, the uh, concept of, you know, when you have a busy schedule, how do you go about incorporating osteopathic manipulative uh, treatment? Okay. Well, that's the thing. I have developed treatments that take anywhere from 10 seconds from diagnosing to fixing to two minutes. And you can fit them all in a 15 minute period and have time to document. Now, if I didn't have to document with EMR, I could probably see 40 patients a day. 
But with EMR, you can comfortably see anywhere from, I don't know, 15 to 25 patients a day. That's amazing. So um, let's talk about a couple of examples of, you know, disorders or uh, dysfunctions that you can treat with LMT. Well, a lot of the things that we see commonly are neck problems, which are easy to fix with either still FPR or gentle HVLA that I teach. Um, there's, you also get first rib syndromes mm -hmm. where people have pain and paresthesias down an arm and it starts with a pain just right at the base of the neck and then it spreads from there. And the innervation goes from the bottom of the neck down to the, the upper part of the back. And that gets involved over a few days. Now, a lot of people go around with this for months or years, not being diagnosed properly, but for a seasoned TO, it's very easy to recognize. And you can just try to fix it. And if it goes away, you know you have the diagnosis. Now, if you look on up to date, they say that it's more common in women, that it's fairly rare, and that if they started getting more serious symptoms like neurovascular compromise, like if they get color changes in their, in their arms and digits, then they actually advocate surgical removal of the first rib, mm -hmm. which is a problem in itself. Any removal of a rib is fraught with dangers. So I have techniques that take anywhere from they take around 10 seconds and they're 95 to 100 percent effective and in that one moment you people all of a sudden start getting feeling in their arms and they also don't have the pain anymore <laughs> okay which is amazing now other things um you know chest pains if they're atypical well you can have people with chest pains and they go through i do a cardiac work i would do an ekg and such and just to make sure it isn't cardiac especially in their age group if they're mm -hmm. in that prone age group and then I go look further in the musculoskeletal region if they can't find anything. And more often than not, you find something there, you fix it, and they're, they're good to go. That's and low back pain is another story. I mean, there's, we can fix anything that's musculoskeletal, basically. Absolutely. So uh, you, you talked about the different techniques. Um, can you give us a little overview of what each technique is if it's not, you know, uh, just a brief overview of what are the different techniques and what can you do with it? Well, the techniques that I do are, are vector changes and just being able to move things back in. First of all, one of the first things I teach the students is how to recognize a lesion and how to diagnose it. Now, I am not a big fan of the nomenclature that they use in schools, like, you know, rotated left, side bent, type one, type two lesion, I think that's overly confusing to students and to figure out how to reverse that takes a lot of time. Okay. And then you're thinking, oh, by, by miss a rotation, I'm going to mess up. My technique is if you look at my hands, if say a lesion is posterior on the right, the transverse process is posterior right at T3, mm -hmm. the lesion I call it is T3 right. So if the Lesion is posterior in the right. Which way does it have to move to fix it? You have to put the posterior process forward, and then you know how to fix it. So in one fell swoop, you, you decrease or you simplify the nomenclature, and then you also made it easier for the student and resident to learn how to fix it. They know what they have to do. Beautiful. The techniques themselves are harder to demonstrate on Let's see, I think of one that I can do. Um, first rib. If you're not a palpate the first rib, you follow from the back to the front and you fall into a recess, which is basically in front of the clavicle. Mm -hmm. And you feel motion there and you feel when you take a deep breath in and deep breath out, what happens is that that rib will hang up because it's stuck outside its articulation. Mm -hmm. So it's sitting like on the cup instead of being in the cup. And so, that's how you know that it's out. Now, in order to do it, I use a modified still technique, which is a long lever technique. I'm gonna back up to show it. You see my arm. You basically, while you're palpating the first rib, you press in on the first rib with the other hand um, to the point where you feel movement at the first rib, which is just a few ounces. And you start in this position, actually. And then while maintaining that pressure, you flip the arm up. Mm -hmm. maintaining the pressure on the first rib and that's all it is 
And it works 100% of the time. Incredible. So um, what is your advice for um, students or residents who want to pursue um, you know, your specialty, who want to do more osteopathic manipulative treatment? I think the first thing is that you have to get the hunger to learn it. Every bit of learning is like wanting to get to know more about it. And you have to have the curiosity. I think that osteopathic schools can do better in terms of first, when the students first come into class, show them palpable techniques, palpable um, evidence that this stuff works, and then work on, on maybe making it easier to understand in terms of nomenclature, and then showing them techniques that are effective, okay? Um, I think that attendings themselves, if they're good at OMM, they should openly volunteer to teach students and residents because that's where the future of our profession is. Mm -hmm. And we, we are distinct. We are different. We are the Swiss Army Knife of Doctors. And the, the website that I was going to do for students and residents, um, I originally was going to call it, we, can't, we do more, but I didn't want to offend the AMA. So mm -hmm. the site is actually, yes, we can do more.com. And that would be... Um, not so offensive to other people and, and, and would also demonstrate that we are capable of more treatments, more understanding of the human body, more um, capabilities of helping people. Absolutely. Okay. Um, any final thoughts, anything else that you wanted to discuss that we didn't uh, talk about? Well, I think the most important thing is that every doctor is going to be going through heck learning all the materials that we need to learn. I know that you want to be a family practitioner just as me. Um, you use pretty much everything that you learn. Mm -hmm. And the key in, in the process is that when you use it, it gets cemented into the brain. Okay. And the more experience you, you see for learning, the better you get. I always advocate that students try to get into a tertiary care center somewhere where other hospitals need to send their patients to that they can't figure out. Because the more you see in terms of variety, in terms of pathology, the better you will become as a doctor to recognize disease processes. And to also, one of the things that I always felt is that I want to learn how the human body works, not just chemical processes. I would like to learn and get an idea of what would work in the sense that if I understand how the human body works and how muscles and nerves and bones work, I can figure out how I can fix it. And Dr. Shywitz always said that A.T. Still didn't learn everything from a book. He innovated everything. So we as DO should learn how to innovate. And that's an important thing to know too. Beautiful. Um, I'm just trying to think of what else I could impart to you. If you guys ever get sleepy in, in, in residency, I used to, I was, a resident before the Bell Commission. So the longest I went without sleep was 96 hours. And, uh, and one of the attendings said to me, Jin, if you can make a decision at 96 hours, can you imagine the damn good decision you'll make when you're awake? Uh, I always remembered that. <laughs> <laughs> but the, one of the things that helps you stay awake in, in terms of if you really get sleepy during residency or on call, mm -hmm. is I took a basin of cold water and ice and I would stick my face in it. And that woke you up for hours. <laughs> <laughs> and that I'll leave you as the last bit of advice. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate all the um, topics that you discussed. Uh, and thank you for taking the time to sit down and talk with us. You're very welcome, Arzu. Thank you for inviting me.